when I was first a Christian, I used to sing that song all the time. I remember being in a church and people looking at me like I was crazy when I would uh, sing along with that song. And I praise the Lord, I'm not in that kind of church anymore. Um, that was my uh, first song as a Christian. That was my favorite song. It really was. So I, I thank the Lord for that. My glorious day that will be. Okay, so last... Last week, not, we weren't in Revelation last week, the week before that we were. So let's let's talk about uh, that week for a second here. What do you remember from that week? I know it was a couple weeks ago, but what do you remember about the Lord today from that teaching? What day did I tell you that was? Go, Tracy. Uh, if you're referring to the Sabbath day or just the Lord's day? The Lord's day. Oh, okay. What day did I say that was? Uh, that'd be the uh, first day of the week. That's right, which is Sunday for us. Mm -hmm. right. Did early church and how they called the Lord's Day Sunday, the first day of the week. And we even looked at some quotes from different people. And uh, some people, you know, call it Sunday because they worship the sun. But obviously, like Tertullian said, we devote Sunday to rejoicing for a far different reason than sun worship, S-U-N. But for S O N, worship. Maybe we should rename it S O N Day Sunday. So it's a it's the Lord's Day, and we saw that that was 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 Sunday, the first day of the week. Um, and then we talked about uh, the seven lampstands. Uh, talk to me about that a second. Tell me remember about that. The seven lampstands. Do they represent seven churches? Seven churches, okay. And bigger picture, what are they, what are they representing? The the overall the whole the church. Whole, the overall church. That's right. And Jesus is in the midst of them, and he is in the midst of every true church. And if he's not, they're not a true church. Um, he must be in the midst. And so we see that the of course the seven uh, lampstands, the lampstands in of themselves don't have light. They get their light from a different source. Just like we and ourselves don't have any light, we get our light from a different source. That's the Lord Jesus. It's like the moon and the sun in the sky. And we looked at the uh, Son of Man, and how it's referring to Jesus' humanity, that he looks like a man, a human, um, and that he's a son of Adam, a son of man in that sense. Okay, well this week we're going to finish up chapter 1, and we're going to uh, start reading in verse 12 just to get uh, the context here, and we're going to read all the way through verse 20, verse 12 of chapter 1. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like that sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Amen. So we see lots of descriptive language here, like, 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 over and over again, uh, as John describes the Lord Jesus Christ. So... Let's start halfway through verse 13, that's where we ended last time. Uh, we ended with the Son of Man last time, it was halfway through verse 13. So we're going to start this week with clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. According to a lot of commentators, clothing down to the feet is symbolic of someone who is of high rank. And since Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that, that makes sense. Uh, Jesus' clothing described here is very similar to the clothing described uh, of the Jewish high priest, which is found in Exodus 28. 
A Jewish high priest had a breastplate that was of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Jesus, however, had a golden band that was real gold. It wasn't just threaded gold. It was real gold. Uh, which we know that the representation of Jesus Christ and the things that he was going to do and the things he's going to do in the future is always more real than the figurative stuff. Uh, the actuality is always more real than the shadow. And so when you see Jesus uh, wearing real gold, it's a step up from what the Jewish high priest wore. And that's the way it's going to be with Jesus. Because he's the real thing, not the shadow of the thing. Um, so it seems to be showing here uh, Jesus in the position of the high priest of the new covenant. Of course, he's not the high priest according to the order of Aaron or Levi, because he is of the tribe of Judah. Rather, he comes in the order of Melchizedek, an eternal priesthood. So as the scriptures say about Jesus, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So once again, this is a greater priesthood than the Levite priesthood or Aaronic priesthood because it never ends. But the priesthood of Levi and Aaron will end. So once again, the actual is a greater than the shadow. Jesus' priesthood is greater than the priesthood of Aaron and Levi. So Jesus' clothing here is symbolic of a kingly, a authoritative high priest. And Jesus is the only one we could ever say this about in all of history, that he's a king and a high priest at the same time. I'm not aware of anyone else who was ever a king and a high priest at the same time. So I believe we can only say this about Jesus. Let me turn to verse 14. It says this about his head and hair. He said, His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. The whiteness of his head and hair are symbolic of two things, in my opinion. Number one, they're symbolic of his purity and holiness. Isaiah 118 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool, if you are willing and obedient. Of course, that scripture is referring to sinners who are in need of cleansing. But it's saying they can be as white as snow. They can be like wool, if they'll come to him and be willing and obedient. So Jesus has never had need of forgiveness. He's always been as white as snow. He's always been like wool. He has always been pure and holy. So I think the first thing is the whiteness of his head and hair represent are his purity and his holiness. I think the second thing it represents is his deity. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9, we see the Ancient of Days described. And if you were to go to that passage that we had already, I think, earlier in the series, you'll see the Ancient of Days is obviously referring to the Father, because the Son in that passage comes to the Father. And so obviously the Father is deity, he's God. But this, this is symbolic of his deity. Listen to the description of Daniel 7-9 of God the Father. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. And the hair of his head was like pure wool. So we're not talking about a dirtied up wool lamb. You know, we were out here playing in the snow earlier this week, and here comes Snoopy galloping along. And she didn't look as white anymore, did she, when you compare her to the snow? That's not the kind of wool we're talking about, though. Obviously, she doesn't have wool. She has, she has fur. But uh, uh, we're talking about a sheep as white as that pure snow out there. And that's what... Jesus was like. And so I think these things are symbolic of his, his purity, his holiness, and his deity, that he's just like the Father and his divine nature. Now we have this, uh, his eyes being called a flame of fire. Obviously symbolic, once again, I don't think he literally had fire in place of eyeballs, okay? Uh, lots of symbolic language here. So, once again, this is symbolic of two things, in my opinion. Number one, his omniscience. Omniscience means all knowledge. Now, we talked about this in one of the earlier teachings of Revelation when we looked at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. We talked about how the seven spirits is referring to the Holy Spirit, since seven is symbolic of perfect, completion, totality. We also looked at Revelation 5, 6, where it says about the Lamb, 
who had been slain, that he had seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. We also looked in that teaching of Zechariah 4.10, which said that these seven are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. In Revelation 4, you can turn to that real quick, in Revelation 4, the throne room of heaven is being described, the throne room of God. And listen to what it says in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5. It says, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So you see here, seven eyes, fire, seven spirits. They're all representing the same thing, the omniscience of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so when it says uh, Jesus has eyes that are of fire, I think it's referring to his omniscience. Uh, so, of course, we're not talking about littleness having fire in his eyes. We're talking about function here. Because eyes see things. Eyes give the person who is using them knowledge or understanding about something. Uh, so just as the seven lamps of fire in Revelation 4, 5 are referring to the seven spirits of God, which see and know everything, Jesus' eyes of fire see everything and know everything. The second thing I think the eyes of fire are symbolic of are his anger and judgment against sin. His anger and judgment against sin. What is God's punishment for the sinner? Well, it's hell fire. Hell fire is God's punishment for the sinner. That is how God takes vengeance and unleashes his anger upon the wicked. Those who continue to be sinners and don't repent. Those who continue to reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the only way to forgiveness. Those who continue to reject God's authority in their life, even though he's been so kind, patient, and merciful towards them. And he has every right to be angry with such a person. This is not a good person and a mean God. This is a wicked person and a good and patient God who's been long-suffering with such a person. But someday that's long suffering when. As Psalm 711 says, God is angry with the wicked every day. And God's punishment is final and never ending. He will punish them with everlasting destruction, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So Jesus' eyes of fire are symbolic of two things his omniscience and his anger and judgment against sinners. And really, if you think about it, the second thing I'm giving you is really a result of the first thing it's Jesus' knowledge of sinners' activities and thoughts and words that makes him angry because he's righteous, because he's holy. If God didn't know about the sin of sinners, he wouldn't be angry at them. He'd have no reason to be angry at them. He'd just be an ignorant, enabling fool. That's all he'd be. Sinners would never get punished, and sinners would be enabled to keep doing their sinning. There's no threat of punishment, why stop if you're getting enjoyment out of it? It's similar to parenting, really. When my parents, when my children do uh, bad things, I'm usually aware of it. Sometimes it seems like I'm supernaturally aware of it. And I tell them, I said, listen, when you sin, I'm living a holy life. God's on my side, not yours. Um, yet I tell them that even if they were to fool me and I never find out what they did, that God knows. You know, you can fool parents, you can fool people, but you can't fool God. Sometimes people get a little absent-minded about that fact because they're not, they can't see God. They can see the people in front of them, looking around, no one's looking. I'll just do this and get away with it. But God's watching. Whether you're aware of it or not, whether you're remembering it or not. You can be, uh, you know, like I said, you can fool parents and people, but you can't fool God. Yet, what would you think of me as a parent if I knew uh, what my children were doing and did nothing about it, you'd think I didn't care. You'd think that I'm lazy. You'd think I'm not a good parent. And what would my children think? Well, they'd think that what they're doing is okay. Uh, they'd think that it's really no big deal. That they can do whatever they like and just get away with it they would think. And would they stop doing what they're doing? Of course not. 
Of course not. They'd have no reason to stop doing it. Just like the sinner had no reason to stop his sinning, a child would have no reason to stop their disobedience. So as a side note to parents here today, you need to make sure that you're continuing to be diligent with your children. You need to persevere with them and disciplining with them, disciplining them and punishing them promptly, early, and as often as they need you to. Otherwise, you show you don't care. You show you are lazy. You show you're not a good parent. You show your children that their bad attitude, their bad actions, their bad words are okay, they're no big deal, and they can just get away with it. That's what you show them. Yet, of course, none of that's true. Each of your children will stand before God someday. And what a terrible thing it will be for them to stand before God with that kind of attitude that you taught them through your inaction. And that kind of thinking that they learned from your parenting or the absence of it. Fortunately, we have the best example of parenting in God. He's patient. He's kind. He's pure. He's understanding to the point where he does not punish people for ignorance. Neither should be. He knows when to punish and how to punish. He knows when to discipline harshly and when to discipline gently. He knows when to offer grace and when to bring judgment. And we simply need to follow his example. Otherwise, we represent God improperly. And we set our children up for failure, not only in this life, but in a life that is to come. In Revelation 1.15, it says, His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. The word translated as fine brass here in the Greek appears only here and in Revelation 2.18 in the whole Bible. And I want to tell you what my, my BDAG lexicon dictionary says about this word. It says, it's an exceptionally fine type of metal or alloy. It says, the word is found nowhere independent of Revelation. The exact nature of this metal or alloy remains unknown. It's a kind of electrum, more precious than gold. And now electrum is an alternate form of gold composed of crystalline substance and fine stone. So this is not really, I mean, the translators try their best to represent what the language says properly. But what the, the lexicons are saying is that we don't know exactly what this is. But what we do know is that it's finer than gold, more precious than gold. It's a kind of electrum uh, that's composed of crystalline substance and fine stone. So... What is the first word that comes to mind when you think of gold or other precious metals? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Valuable. Valuable. That's exactly what comes to my mind. Worth. You know, value or worth. And I think that's really what we should get from this. Uh, this type of metal that his feet were made of were a metal that is more precious than gold. Uh, it has more worth than gold. And Jesus is the most precious and valuable being there is. Not only that, but what does the Bible say about the feet part of the armor of God in Ephesians 6? It says, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6.15 And what does Romans 10.15 say? It says, And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who, bring the who preach the gospel of peace who bring glad tidings of good things. You know, if you think about a person's body that would be most repugnant to you, you'd probably say feet. But yet, in Jesus' feet, the one of the most precious metals there is, is representing his feet. You want to know why? Because he brings the most precious message there is. The gospel of peace, of good tidings. So Jesus' feet are a uh, fine brass, are symbolic of how valuable he is as a person, and how valuable the message he is that he brings. Not only while he was on earth, you know, we see it in the Gospels, but also the message he's about to give John in this book we call Revelation. So it's precious. And, you know, God sees our feet as precious. A Gospel preacher may be on the streets for hours a day. He may have calluses, he may have blisters, his feet probably stink all the time in his shoes. 
but yet God sees them as precious because such a person is faithful to God and his great commission. So the world sees it as, ugh, but God sees this. That's my guy. That's him right there. He's doing my work. And then we see here uh, his voice is the sound of many waters. Have you ever been down to the ocean when the waves are just crashing over and over again? It's so loud, it's difficult to hear yourself talk, let alone the person right next to you talk. Even a waterfall is even louder than that. Yeah, waterfall too. So the sound of many waters is talking about how loud his voice is. So why the loud voice? Well, first of all, he has a very important message. You know, we go out to the public and proclaim God's word to the masses. Uh, we try to speak as loudly as we can. Sometimes even employing bullhorns or acres or half-mile hailers. Because the message we have, we believe it's very important and we want as many people as possible to hear it. Secondly, Jesus speaks in a loud voice because of his authority. You know, I don't raise my voice at my children very often, but when I do, I'll tell you this, they pay attention. They know. Uh, they stop what they're doing and look. They probably think to themselves, what is Daddy about to say? I had better pay attention very carefully. That's not how I normally speak. And that's probably similar to what sinners think on the streets when we're preaching the gospel to open air. What's that, what's that guy saying over there? Why is he yelling? Why, why? This isn't something I see every day. This is unusual. I better go check it out and see what's going on. So when someone raises their voice, I mean, they're doing it because they think what they're saying is important. Even if they're raising their voice for an ungodly reason, they think what they're saying is important. And they're displaying their authority or what they perceive to be their authority. And let me see in, in verse, verse 16. It says, um, He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. So what are these stars in his right hand? Well, according to the end of verse 20, they are the angels of the seven churches. Now, the Greek word angelos, which is translated as angels here, simply means messenger. And sometimes it's referring to a heavenly messenger as an angel from heaven, yet it doesn't always mean that. Uh, the New King James translators, as do most uh, Bible translations simply transliterated the Greek word angelos into the English language instead of translating it. They would have translated they would have said messenger here. And then the person who's reading would have been able to figure out from the context whether it's talking about, you know, an angel from heaven, messenger, or someone who's on earth. And this context, I don't think it's referring to an actual angel or a messenger who comes down from heaven. Yet I do think that it refers to a heavenly messenger in the sense that the people being referred to here should be bringing their respective people messages from heaven from God. Uh, the messengers being spoken of here, the, the angels of the seven churches, are the, the elders, uh, the leaders, the pastors of the respective church. Uh, and you notice, notice where, these, where these seven stars are. They're in the hands of Jesus. And that's where any... That's where any good and biblical leader would be, in the hands of Jesus, uh, doing what he would have them to do, moving where he would have them to move, thinking what he would have them to think, saying what he would have them to say, leading how he would have them to lead. As John 10, 26 through 30 says, But you do not believe because you're not of my sheep, and as I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You see, good and biblical leaders hear Jesus' voice. They have intimate fellowship with him to the point where he says, I know them. I know him. Not just about him, I know him. 
and they follow him wherever he leads. And good and biblical Christians will follow the leaders appointed over them as those leaders follow Jesus Christ. And then it says that Jesus had a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Now, did Jesus literally have a sword coming out of his mouth? Like those guys you see doing the tricks and putting the sword in the mouth and bringing it back out and not, not hurting themselves? No. It'd make it kind of difficult to talk if you had a sword in the mouth, wouldn't it? So what is a sword good for? It's good for piercing. It's good for cutting. It's good for fighting and for killing. Right? And there will be a lot of fighting and killing talked about in this book, and we'll get to that more in greater detail later on. But isn't it amazing that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't need a sword in his hand? He, he doesn't need a weapon in his hand in order to defeat his enemies. He just needs his mouth. That's all he needs. All he needs to do is say the word, and they're done. No fighting is needed at all. Yet, uh, Christians should recognize when they read this passage of Jesus having a two-edged sword come out of his mouth, they should realize hmm, Hebrews 4.12. That's the first thing they think. Which says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And since Jesus is God, every word that comes out of his mouth is the word of God. Every word. And his words are living and powerful. And with his words, he created all things out of nothing. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Now that's powerful right there. Powerful than any other sword wielder there is in the universe. The words of Jesus pierced the heart, working along with a God-given conscience in order to convict the sinner and bring him to repentance. And this is what I think the, the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth means. It's referring to the words that come out of his mouth, that they are from God, since he is God, and that his words are powerful and sharp, doing what they were meant to do. You know, this, this last part, that the words are sharp and powerful and bring conviction, you know, that really could be said about a preacher who's preaching the word of God, and he was doing it under the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, that's exactly what you see on the day of Pentecost. The Apostle Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and at the end of his sermon, Acts 2.37, the, the hearers listen to how they respond. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Because he's using the sword of the Spirit. Cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Of course, he gave them instructions, and 3,000 were saved that day. Yet preaching God's word under the power of the Holy Spirit does not guarantee converts. It didn't guarantee converts for Jesus. And didn't guarantee Congress for Stephen. In Acts 7.54, listen to how his, his hearers responded to his message. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Same thing. Word of God went forth. Two people full of the Holy Spirit. He even says it in the passages. And the hearers were cut to the heart. Now the first set of hearers in the day of Pentecost got saved. 3,000 of them. But here it says they gnashed at te their teeth with him. At him. Gnashed at him with their teeth. And, of course, they stoned him to death. They killed him. So, preaching God's word under the Holy Spirit's power only guarantees that it will do what it was sent to do. Convict sinners of their sin and give them hope in Jesus. Sinners might respond to that in anger and hate. Sinners might respond to that in humility and brokenness. That's completely up to them. The word of God is simply an influence in the matter. And it says that... Uh, his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. It's like the sun on a summer day when it's at its height. You know, when you don't want to be outside because it's 100 degrees outside. And it's just scorching you. That's what it's talking about here. Um, and when you think about the brightness of the sun, what do you think of? I think of how powerful it is. I think of how mighty it is. I think, I don't even want to look up there. I don't even want to mess with that. You know, because if you look too long at it, it'll hurt your eyes. It'll scorch your eyeballs. And that's what I think Jesus' countenance represents here. How powerful he is, how mighty he is. That you better not mess with him or you're going to get burned. Literally. You better not mess with him or you're going to get burned. As the saying goes. 
And then in verse 17, it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. If you saw all of what John was seeing, I'm sure that he would fall down as dead too. I know I would. I know I would. Yet there is some significance to this. John is the apostle who was so close to Jesus and so intimate with him that he leaned on Jesus' chest at the Passover meal and called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's what he said about himself. He mentioned it over and over again all throughout the Gospel of John. So John was comfortable enough when Jesus was on earth to do those things and say those things about himself concerning his relationship with Jesus. But now he falls as dead, as a dead man at his feet. I think this says a lot about Jesus' appearance at this point. Um, I really don't think there's, I mean, I know John is trying to describe, but I don't think there's words that can describe his experience. He can describe Jesus' appearance, but his experience with Jesus' glorified, glorified body I don't think he can really tell you what he's feeling and going through. So, in other words, John, the words John uses to describe Jesus will be nothing like experiencing Jesus for yourself and standing before him like John is in this passage. If this is the way John responds to seeing him, imagine what it will be like for us. Imagine what it will be like for sinners. When a friend of Jesus, who laid his head on Jesus' bosom, and was called the disciple whom Jesus loved, fell down as dead. I mean, can you name one of the person on this earth who you're a good friend with, who you walk into their presence, you fall down as dead before their feet? No, You wouldn't even think about it, right? You go up and give them a hug. You say hi to them. You shake their hand. You don't fall down as dead. No. Imagine what it will be like for somebody. You know, I was, I was, as I wrote my notes out, I just began to tremble at the thought of it. Began to weep at the thought of it for sinners. What it will be like for them, for those who are his enemies to stand before him. I mean, just, just forget about even hell for a second. You have to stand before Jesus, the one who created hell. The one who's going to put sinners in hell. Oh, Lord, that we would all be right with you on that day. Of course, like Jesus does with, with his friends, he gives John comfort. He gives him assurance. He gives strength to him. In the first part of verse 18, and obviously we've, we've gone through this first and last stuff before, it's obviously referring to his divine nature, his eternal divine nature again. And obviously it's clearly speaking of Jesus that says, I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And at this point in history, and even up to this point where we're at right now, that can only be said of Jesus. No one else in history up to this point can you say, they were dead, and now they're alive forevermore. No one else. Because no one else has been resurrected from the dead yet. Only Jesus. And then in the second part of verse 18, it says, Jesus says, I have the keys of Hades and of death. If I say I have the keys to my home and my shed, what would you think? What would be the function you would think about what power I have? I can lock it and I can unlock it. I can put stuff in there. I can take stuff out. Right? That's how to think function here. It means I have the ability to go into them and the ability to leave them. And I believe that's what it means when Jesus has these keys as well. That it's important uh, that you understand this. Jesus has the keys to Hades and to death. But not the same place. They're different places. Hades is where souls, where spirits are of dead people. And they will be there until the two resurrections. Of course, you want to be part of the first one, not the second one. And they will stay there until their respective resurrections. Death is where the physical bodies are until the two resurrections. And Jesus has the keys to both these places. So what he's saying is that he has the authority, he has the power, 
not only to put people in those places, but to take them out of these places, to call them out, whether they want to or not. It's not as if they can call people out and they say, well, I don't want to come up. They're coming up. Not just to say, you're going down. They say, well, I don't want to go down. You're going down. Now, if someone else come along and take the keys and unlock it and say, hey, man, I know you're suffering down there in lower Hades. Come on out, man. Now, only Jesus can do these things. He has the keys to death in Hades. So when someone physically dies, it happened either because God caused it or God allowed it to happen. So only Jesus has the authority to send people to Hades and their physical bodies into the ground and to bring forth their bodies and souls, their spirits, and their resurrection. Yeah, this isn't some authority that God gives to just some man. This is the kind of authority that God alone has. So I think Jesus having these keys is another indication of Jesus' divine nature. You don't give this authority to some man. Authority that God alone has. And then verse 19 says, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So Jesus, as he's talking to John, he divides what John has, is going to write down into three sections. The first section is the things which you have seen. That's everything, since it's in the past tense, everything he's seen so far. So all of chapter 1. He said, Tom, I'm going to write those things down. Okay? And then he says, uh, the second section would be the things which are. And that would be everything from uh, chapters 2 and chapters, chapter 2 and chapter 3. The things which are, talking about the seven churches. The things he'll write down concerning that. Because it's, it's talking, Jesus is talking to him about those churches in present tense. How the condition of those churches right now, while well, John is receiving this revelation. And then the third section that Jesus divides this book that John's going to write down into is the things which will take place after this, later on. And that's everything beginning with Revelation chapter 4 all the way through the end of chapter 22 and verse 21. Now why do I say that? Well, let's go to Revelation 4.1. Let's see what it says. It says, After these things I looked... And behold, see, after these things, after he wrote down everything about the churches, after these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first thing which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Exactly what he said over at the end of uh, chapter 1, verse 19. The things which will take place after this. The things which will take place after this. Okay, so... Uh, there's three sections here that he's going to write. So there's chapter 1, chapters 2 and 3, and then chapters 4 and onward. Those are the three sections Jesus divides this book of Revelation into. Okay, in the upcoming weeks we're going to go through uh, the different churches. And uh, what I want you to prepare yourself for and focus on is whether this is, would relate to you. You know, if the shoe fits, you wear it. If the rock is thrown into the chicken coop and it hits you, you're going to yelp. And so, you know, examine yourself and see if um, you're, you could possibly be one of the ones Jesus is talking to. And we need to examine ourselves corporately to make sure we're not like any of these churches. Well, five of them anyway. We could be like the dealer too. But five of them we don't want to be like. Okay, at least. So, I think Jesus' description, of, I mean, John's description of Jesus is, is a glorious description. But like I said, I mean, it's going to be a, an amazing thing to stand before him and see it for ourselves. And I can't imagine how it's going to feel if John felt on his day. Okay, we'll put the floor for discussion, for questions, and for objections.
Thank you, brother. <clears throat> in the, uh, the first part of the teaching, we were talking about Jesus being the only person in history being king and priest. And uh, But there were some others that tried to be a king and priest. Um, I was thinking Saul, but I couldn't couldn't remember. Could you help me out with that? Uh, I don't remember Saul trying to be a priest. I remember him prophesying along with the prophets. Okay. I remember him doing things he shouldn't be doing. I remember the only thing I, close I could come to was David ate the showbread, but he wasn't trying to be a priest. Okay. That's something he shouldn't have been doing, according to law, but uh, he was hungry. So love you know, triumphed over that. Um, but I can't think of anyone who tried to be a king and a priest at the same time. I guess the, the closest would be uh, Samuel. But he wasn't a king, he was a judge. Uh, so he had authority as a leader, and then they asked for a king. Because they didn't want God to be a king anymore. One of the kings tried to make the offering of the priest, and he was turned into a leper. Okay. I think it was, there was Ahaz, or uh, there was a king, he, he went and tried to off, make the offering of the priest. Right. And God turned him into a leper. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I can't remember exactly yeah, can who it is. Right. We could look that up, though. Either way, he wasn't... Yeah, he wasn't authorized. He wasn't called to be a, a, a sure, priest. Sure yeah, it was, only Jesus has been with that, so... Yeah. And then the, the point you made about uh, the fine brass being a special type metal. Right. And even brass in itself, so they use that descriptor uh, in the in the translation. In the Navy, we use brass. Uh, all brass had to be around the, the compass, the ship's compass, because right. it's uh, not magnetic, and so okay. it wouldn't. It was a durable metal. It was a good metal. It didn't rust, right. but it wasn't uh, one that would deflect the compass. So it was a special metal that we used hmm. in the Navy. I just thought that was an interesting point to bring up. Yeah, and. Um, in talking about the messengers, the angels, or the elders, pastors, leaders, yeah. is there any uh, any uh, extra biblical evidence that these uh, were actual apostles, the named apostles, or they just maybe different messengers? That... I don't think they're apostles. I mean, at this point in time, only one apostle is alive. That's true. That's John. So, and <laughs> and, and we we kind of know from church history. At least some of these, who are the who are the bishops of these churches at this point in time? Well, I guess that's what I'm, I'm fishing yeah. for there. So okay, well, I mean, um, I'm, when we go through them individually, I'll, I'll probably touch on that more. But I can tell you right at that the Smyrna, uh, that was Polycarp. Okay. So we have lots of his writings. Um, I don't know off the top of my head the rest of them, yeah, but uh, we're going to get to it. Okay. Yeah. And another interesting point you were mentioning about the keys. And I know in, in military organizations or any organization, the more keys you have, the more authority you have. Right. And these keys that Jesus hold, even though they may not be numerically right. a lot, those two keys are a lot of power yeah. within those two keys. So I thought that was interesting, too. Yeah, it's the only one the scripture says that has these keys. It's him. So. Uh -oh. I'm sorry. Um, I just maybe think about Jesus giving, giving keys to Peter. Yeah. And that, uh, and that uh, apologetic about uh, for Roman Catholics right. just came to my mind. Yeah, yeah um, I was just kind of unclear about something. You said that uh, in Daniel seven nine uh, that there was talking about the ancient of days. Yeah. Were you saying that that's in reference to? Uh, God the Father, or yep. Okay, is there a reason why you why you believe that? Good, look at Because I've always had uh, an understanding that God the Father was invisible, and that Jesus was the uh, visible manifestation of God, and that God the Father Himself is invisible. That's why. Verse my, thirteen of Daniel seven. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. The Son of Man is Jesus and the ancient days is the Father. Okay, thanks for clearing that up. I was just kind of curious about that. So I guess the invisible manifestation of God is strictly the Holy Spirit. Because there's other verses that says God is invisible. 
So I was trying to get it all straight in my head as far as well, the trinity he's goes. invisible for most people right now. Mm -hmm. He's not going to be invisible for good. The Holy Spirit? No, God the Father. Oh, okay. The Father's invisible, I mean, for all of us right now. Not oh, yeah, I know he's omnipresent. Not just seeing the Father. No, I'm not saying, not even saying he's omnipresent. I'm talking about his manifest presence. Seeing him in his form right. is invisible to us now. But someday he's going to dwell with us. Right. So it's not going to be invisible forever. Right. I'm not going to belabor the point or anything. I, I, it's obvious that what you're saying is true. Yeah. It just is changing a lot of the way I've looked at things in the past. So yeah. that's what, uh, So I, I'm, I'm guessing then, I have to look into a little bit deeper, but uh, I guess then um, uh, when Moses saw the backside of God, it was the Father that he was looking at. Yeah, I believe so. Okay, that's it. That's interesting. All right, thanks. Yeah. And you can correct me, obviously, if I'm wrong about this, but please do. Uh, the Holy Spirit is manifested as living water flowing from the throne in the kingdom to come. Is that correct? I don't, I don't know that. I don't okay. Know what, is there a research that I look into that? Okay. If I can answer that. Have you... Uh, have you encountered um, these uh, who call themselves the Hebrew black Israelites? No. And heard them use that feat? Like, oh. like have, you, have, you, have you ever run into that? Well, I mean, I, I've that never Jesus heard them say that to me, but I mean, burnish, I mean, brass refined in the fire is not the same color as someone who has dark colored skin. It's like a gold almost, like a dark gold. I don't know anyone with dark gold skin, unless you, maybe someone who's uh, from Asia goes out and gets in the sun too long. Maybe maybe they would be, you know, somewhat the color of burnished brass, but there's no way someone who's from, from Africa originally as descendants is burnished brass in their color. Yeah. That's stretching it right. to the limits. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, but they, they, they grasp the straws all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. the things I've heard them say, just there's no way. You have to really be under strong delusion in your mind to even accept what they're saying. You have to want it to be true first to even be willing to listen to them and say, well, maybe that is true. About, I, when I was in, it was 2006, I was in New York City. There was an evangelist boot camp there, and we, we ran into them. They actually were on the streets. They had a stage, you know, probably, you know, pretty wide, and there was like three or four of them up there, and they were dressed in like priestly-type clothing, too. And, you know, the people who are light-skinned like me, they kind of dismissed us, didn't even want to talk to us, because we're, you know, we're damned. We're not part of the elect. We're not part of Israel. Uh, but the people who were in our group who are darker color skin, they wanted to talk to them, try to convince them. But what they were doing, they were using us the same way some open-air preachers might use a heckler. They might use a heckler to draw a crowd. And so if some of my guys started heckling them, it was starting to form out, listen, guys, we're not going to help them out here. Let's move on. You know, let's move on, because I'm not going to help them out. These guys are just under such strong delusion. Yeah. Uh, really, it, it would probably take someone of the same skin color as them to save them, to get them out of that, because they won't even listen to it. And it has to be really probably one-on-one. -on -one. If you get in the open air with them, they're going to use you to draw a crowd and mm -hmm. you know, try to delude as many people as possible. Yeah, and that, it just even trying to use the passage that way is right. uh, it, it defies the hermeneutics anyway. Well, yeah. in, the in the context, it's 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 speaking uh, of symbolism here, obviously, because right, like you said, it's not a literal sword coming out of his mouth. Right. It's not a literal fire. These these are explaining, um, uh, like you said, different attributes of God and and, and why, why is why is if we're going to take that like they are? Why are, if, if we're going to say that burnished brass is darker color skin? Why is his head white? Yeah. So, I mean, I could use the same thing. I said, look, it's a white Jesus, but I know he's not a white Jesus. Right. He's a Middle Eastern Jesus. Exactly. He's probably in between somewhere. So, it's just nonsense to even say that. Yeah, it is nonsense. I'm talking about skin color here. Right. That's right. God doesn't see that. His eyes are like a fire. And I was thinking how it says the, the eyes are the lamp of the body. That's what the scripture says. Even right. the eyes are the lamp of the body. So the eyes are lamp. clean. The whole body. Is clean. Yeah, the whole body is clean. The eyes aren't clean. The, your body's full of darkness. So right. the eyes is burning like a lamp, and so that that kind of that kind of fits there too. And his, and he sees if is talking about seeing and knowing. He sees way deeper than the skin color. That the, that burns it goes goes to the core. 
you know. Um, he, he doesn't, he's not looking at that word appearance. So Makes that's just the know, flesh. Man. Amen. Amen. Yeah, 1 Samuel 16, 7 should make me think of that. Mm -hmm. Where Samuel came and was choosing the next king and, and he rejected all the first sons that Jesse brought forth and said, well, God doesn't judge by appearance. Mm -hmm. I would by the heart. Is that a verse about um, all nations are of one blood? Uh, Acts 17. Acts 17, yeah. Yeah, we actually met a couple up in Louisville. I think the last preach. Huh. They gave them 1726. They could not, would not deal with it. Right. Bring us. No, deal with this verse. Yeah. And then, of course, we see in, in Revelation here, I'm trying to find it right now, where many tribes, tongues, and nations will stand before him and glorify him. Okay. So yeah. they can't deal with that either. So. Right. Yeah, because it says right there that they should seek the Lord, that happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So it's saying all nations are of the same blood. Mm -hmm. So that right there, these two verses, sure totally refute yeah. that only <coughs> people with dark skin are going to be saved. That's the nation they elect, brother. Right. <laughs> well, I'm just saying. They use the same herb the Calvinist. It says right. all. It says all. And Jews, all of the same blood, Jews. and that they all should seek, and be found. So. Anyway. Plus, a lot of it. A lot of it relies on extra biblical stuff. You know, if, if your hermeneutic relies solely on extra biblical stuff to prove your point, it's a, it's, a, it's like the foundation of everything you believe, and using extra biblical stuff that supposedly is true. To prove who the true descendants of Israel are, then I mean you're really on shaky ground. Yeah. I mean you gotta you gotta get your truth from the Bible. Amen. I mean you may go to extra biblical stuff for sometimes to, to help support points you already have in the Bible, but they can't do that. So yeah, their their whole foundation is extra biblical stuff. Supplement extra biblical supplement the Bible right. as a foundation, but it's upside down for them. That's right. That's yeah. exactly what it is. That's what I've noticed. There's actually another version of, of them out there. It's been out a little bit longer, called uh, British Ir Israelism. Okay. And there's people who believe from Britain that they were part of the tribe of Israel that may have been lost or whatever, mm -hmm. and that they are royal blood because of that. Oh, like the king and queen of Israel. Yeah, and it's like it's, it's uh, British Israelism. Yeah, I think I've heard of that. Yeah, so that's, that's a little bit older, but it's the same idea, just a different... Yeah, it's a different look, different appearance. Mm -hmm. So that they would say that the kings of England were all in the line of David. Well, maybe Israel. not the land of David, but a house of Israel. No, the lost, lost tribe okay. of Israel kind of thing. I thought I had heard that they, they thought they were part of the royalty of Israel. Oh, that they maybe. were part of the royal line. But if that were true, then they wouldn't be able to, to really rule as king because of that uh, curse of uh, Jeconiah. That's right. The only person to rule now is Jesus. Right. And Joshua found that verse for me. So Revelation 7, starting verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So these two verse sets of verses completely destroys their, the foundation of their view. So I don't know how people fall for that kind of stuff, man. Because like I said, I think they come to it wanting to it. I mean, here, here, think about it, especially here in America, because of slavery and all the issues we had here in the past. Uh, a lot of people uh, who have descendants who went through that, they're looking for some kind of, uh, I don't know, some kind of recompense or looking for some way to deal with that, maybe. Uh, and so, you know, that have to guard themselves against that of becoming somewhat like the people who did it to their relatives because the, the people who did it to their relatives, a lot of them were saying, we're special people, you're not. And now they're doing the same thing, we're special people, you're not. This is just in reverse, just racism in reverse, all this. Yeah. Yeah. And one, one other point just yeah. came to my mind yeah, is, is on the day of Pentecost. Um, all those languages. When, yeah, all those languages. and they, So all those people groups... The gospel goes forth in their language. Right. Okay. So obviously God's trying to reach those people groups, and you have you have people groups that are not just from Africa. There. That's right. You you have you have those from uh, the the Elamites, you know, from Persia. You right. have you have Arab there, Arab people, and you know, so the gospel is going forth to all those different people groups. Right. And why would God on the day of Pentecost send the gospel forth and those people get saved if they're not? 
Or why would you just say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Why would you say, go to Jerusalem today, a Samaria, and to the ends of the earth? I mean, even if, even if they say, they either say, well, all the world means just these people, yeah. the, how they try to do that. But you can't get around, actually, the names of these. Right. See, even the word says in Revelation, it says nations. When it says nations, they say, oh, well, nations means just these nations in Africa right. or something. And, but here in Acts chapter 2, it actually lists these people groups that get saved. Right. And the gospel goes forth, and they're not just, you know, from Africa. I wonder if this group of people have any missionaries they're sending to Africa. <laughs> it seems like they have more customers there, so to speak, than they would over here. They'd probably be, uh, have a lot of conflicts with the Muslims if they went to Africa with that stuff. Well, let them them. I'm just saying. Don't you think? <laughs> if they went to, to face Boko Haram or something with, the, with sure. that stuff, I think they'd probably find themselves in a, in a big... Well, it's their job conflict. to convert them. Yeah. To help them realize they're part of, you know, the true Israelites. Yeah. Yeah, so it's said in the word.